When we're mindless, we think we know. We take these absolutes. There's no need to pay any attention because, after all, we know what it is. When we're mindful, we're aware that everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. And essentially, uncertainty is the rule, not the exception. Collective Insights is a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. Hi, I'm Dr. Gregory Kelly. Before we get into this week's episode, I want to talk about one of the most important molecules in your body to help you age well. I'm talking about NAD+. High NAD plus levels help our bodies stay youthful in so many ways, such as creating energy, maintaining healthy DNA, detecting and using nutrients efficiently, and protecting your cellular health. But in our 30s and 40s, our NAD levels start to plummet. That's why our science team made Qualia NAD+. Qualia NAD Plus is a clinically tested formula with an uncommonly advanced approach. It can boost NAD Plus levels up to 50% by combining 14 key ingredients, including three premium NAD Plus precursors, working together to support NAD Plus production deep into life. To learn more about NAD Plus research and to try Qualia NAD Plus risk-free for 100 days, go to qualialife.com slash NAD15 and use code nad 15 for 15% off Qualia. That's NAD15 for better aging at qualialife.com slash NAD15. Hi, this is Dr. Greg. I'll be hosting today's episode. And with us, we have Ellen Langer. She's earned three Distinguished Science Awards, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Liberty Science Genius Award, while she's been a professor in the psychology department at Harvard. She's considered the mother of mindfulness, and the mother of positive psychology. Her most recent book is The Mindful Body, Thinking Our Way to Chronic Health. Welcome to our show today, Dr. Langer. Thank you, Gregory. So I read your most recent book about two and a half to three weeks ago, and for listeners, I thought it was wonderful. I was really surprised that there was quite a few different research studies that I was at least somewhat aware of, and that the same person had been involved in all of them and was really super intrigued with a lot of the research you mentioned in the book that I wasn't aware of. And I think our listeners are going to love it as well. So can you start just by sharing a little bit of your background and you know what led you to write The Mindful Body? Well, it's interesting. The Mindful Body started out as a memoir, which was kind of fun going through my life, mostly an academic memoir. And I think that the motivation for it, as all my other books, is I amassed a fair amount of new data that I found very exciting and wanted to share it with people. And writing these books seems to me the best way of doing it. Because this started as a memoir, the the stories that are in it make it come more alive than perhaps to some of my other books. And for example, I'm probably the only person you know who has two pancreas stories, which maybe I'll tell you, maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> And, you know, somebody that I'm often asked, uh, how did I come to all of this? And my answer is really very simple, that when I was young, I was very, very fortunate, I still am, that I had parents that were wonderfully, wonderfully supportive and loving. And I, my mother would have had me laminated if she could have. And so I was always happy, always positive, and interacting even with little kids where they would be upset. And I said, well, why don't you look at it this way And in child days? And I remember at one point an adult who was interacting with me. I don't remember who the adult was, and maybe that's a good thing, because he or she said to me, why are you smiling? And it immediately took the smile off of my face. And today, if anybody said that to me, and they still do, I, I would come back with, why aren't you smiling? So, and I think that another reason for me to write these books is that I think that people are totally oblivious to how much we can actually accomplish. That I believe that once we recognize that everything is mutable, everything can be changed, everything that is was at one point a decision, which means there was uncertainty, um, and which means that there are other alternatives that could also work. Uh, when we recognize this, 
the things we can accomplish are just massively beyond where we are now. I have a lot of respect for my colleagues, but my colleagues tend to take a problem and then make things better. And I, in the book, talk about many of these situations where we should go for better than better. Let me give you one little example. I asked my students, how far is a person humanly capable of running? And because the marathon is 26 miles, they start with 26. Then it becomes like an auction, 28, 30. And essentially, somebody says 50. Everybody in the class groans, and that's the end of it. Then I turn on a, a video of the Tarayamora, which is a tribe in Copper Canyon in Mexico, and they're running 200 miles without stopping. Now, the difference between 50 and 200 is enormous, and there's no reason to think that 200 is the limit. So essentially, it's my believing you can, you can. Why am I the only person who believes this? I'll do some research. Please look at it. <laughs> I, I think the other, the other piece that's kind of interesting to me is that Right now, it's like everybody is up against metal or you know, wall, and they keep banging into it and scratching it. And I think most people believe to have the kind of lives that they want, they have to make massive changes. And if you imagine that you're in this car and you keep hitting the wall, all you need to do is move inches away. So I believe with an understanding of a few things, big changes can come from very small steps that people can make. Oh, well, what a wonderful way to start our conversation. I know one of the things I highlighted from, it was chapter nine in the book, but it was this idea that you tend to design research to uncover what is possible. And I think you just described the heart of that, right? That your goal isn't to find out what you know, people think we can do, it's to discover what's even more possible, which is super cool. Yeah, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that came to me years ago. I was at this horse event. I told the story so many times, but I think it maybe bears retelling at this horse event, and this man asked me, can I watch his horse? Because he wanted to get his horse a hot dog. I'm Yale Harvard all the way through. I mean, nobody knows better, maybe as well. Horses don't eat meat. He came back with the hot dog and the horse ate it. And it was at that moment that I realized everything I know could be wrong. And for me, that was actually very exciting because that meant all of the things that I've been told led to believe can't happen, possibly could happen. Wow, wonderful. I think one of the things for sure that I was aware of that you'd been involved in is what you refer to as the counterclockwise study, which you've replicated a few times since. And I'm sure some of our listeners would know about or have you know some awareness of that study. Okay. So let me, let me explain to people. The counterclockwise study was conducted many years ago. As you're alluding to, it's a famous study. I can say it's famous, even though it's mine. Because if you tune in to The Simpsons Go to Havana, they actually talk about the static. It was the first test of this idea of mind-body unity. So people talk about a mind and a body, and then the major problem was, how do you get from a mind, something fuzzy, a thought, to something material called the body? And I think that uh, trying to figure that out, which people have been doing for forever, is what was holding up important research. So in my mind, I said, mind, body, these are just words. Let's put them back together. And if you see the mind and the body as a single unit, then wherever you're putting one, you're necessarily putting the other. And we have a lot of control over where we put our minds. So this first test was to take old men to put their minds back in time and see what happens by taking the measurements mostly from the body. So we retrofitted a retreat, timeless retreat, to 20 years earlier, had these elderly men live there for a week as if they were their younger selves, talking about past events in the present tense, so on. And in that very short period of time, we found vision improved, hearing improved, strength, memory, and they look noticeably younger. And all that's happening without any medical intervention. So that was the first of many studies. All of the new ones are reported in the mindful body. But the next one is kind of fun also. I, I think they, they're all interesting, which is why I did them. But it's a study we did with chambermaids. Interestingly, chambermaids, you know, they're the people who are cleaning the hotel and motel rooms. So they're working, um, exerting effort all day long. But if you ask them, are you getting any exercise? Oddly, they say no, because they think, 
exercise is what you do afterward. That's what the Surgeon General, who sits behind a desk, says. And you know, so if they're doing this exercise all day long, which they are, and if exercise is good for you, they should be healthy, healthier than socioeconomically equivalent other people, people just like them but who are not exercising. Turns out they're not. So we take these chambermaids, we divide them into two groups, very simple study, and we teach one of the two groups that their work is exercise. We show them the different things they're doing and making a bed is like working at this machine at the gym and so on. So now we have two groups, one group that realizes their work is exercise, the other group that doesn't. We make sure the groups are not eating more or less than the other groups, they're not working any harder, as well as we could assess it. The two groups are the same except for this difference in their mindsets. Those people who now saw their work as exercise lost weight. There was a change in waist-to-hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure came down. It's all kind of amazing. Now, people, many people know about placebos, which are also evidence for mind-body unity. You know, you take this nothing and somehow you get better. This chambermaid study was really a nocebo effect. What people often don't understand is that if you're taking medication, for example, and you believe it won't work, chances are it's not going to work. So these chambermaids are exercising, but not realizing that it was exercise, and it didn't have the effect of exercise. There, there's lots of evidence that I report in the book for mind-body unity. People, There's some studies other people have done, which are wonderful, where they have people imagining they're exercising. So you're not doing anything but thinking of yourself you know, lifting weights, for example. And the results of the imagined exercise are very similar to the real exercise. And let me tell you, there are lots of the mind-body studies that we've done. Let me just give you an example of one of the more recent ones. And this was done with my graduate student, Peter Ongel. So we inflict the wound, not a big wound because we're not sadists, but a wound. And people are in front of a clock and unbeknownst to them, the clock is rigged. So for a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's going half as fast as real time. And for a third of the people, it's real time. Now, most people prior to this work would assume that it's going to heal when it heals. You know, it needs a passage of time. Time heals all wounds, so it'll heal their wounds. Well, it turns out that what was more important than just the passage of time was the belief of how much time had passed. That is, the wound healed based on clock time, the time they thought it was, rather than the time it was. We have lots of these sorts of studies. For example, we have studies where people are in a sleep lab, they wake up, they're led to believe they got two hours more sleep than they got, or two hours fewer. And again, uh, what happens is biological and cognitive functioning seems to follow perceived amount of sleep. Now, if you consider this, what, uh, one of the practical applications of the fatigue work is that it leads to an appreciation that fatigue is largely a psychological construct. So there's this wonderful study that this person did, I think in the 50s, Frank Beach. He took a little boy rat, several of them, but one at a time, introduced a little girl rat, and they copulate, and then the little boy rat can't take anymore. He needs a refractory period. He needs to rest. That is unless the experimenter immediately added a new little girl rat, and then he was ready to go right away. All right, so you change the context, and all of a sudden we have renewed energy. When I think that idea, right, that the context is so important, right, almost the mindset and the setting, just in all of the research you've just shared and in others that you've done, is so powerful. One of my favorites in the book was MIT ROT students on vision. And I related to it because I went through ROTC before in my first career as a Navy officer. And my vision wasn't good enough from the get go to qualify to go into the pilot pipeline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I read that study and my, my vision today is slightly better than it was when I was 18. But I read that and it was like, oh, I wish I knew, <laughs> knew about her work, you know, back in 1980. So. Yeah. You know, well, so what happens is we go to the medical world, we get measured at one point in time, and then we tend to 
think that that's what we are, whatever it is. I mean, when I used to, sometimes I would lecture and I'd ask, does anybody know their cholesterol level? And the person who's got a good number is waving their hand and they're so proud of themselves. So I'd call on that person and then they'd state the number. Then I'd ask them, when was the last time you had it measured? And they said, maybe six months ago. And then I would say, hoping they understood, and you haven't eaten or exercised since. Point is that you're, all of these, our cholesterol level, our heart rate, our vision, are constantly changing. And we don't want to take one snapshot and presume that that's who we are. You know? and, and the idea of testing uh, vision by having people look at letters that are static typically in black and white, you know, that make no sense seems to me odd. I I don't know about you, but for me, if I'm hungry, I can see the restaurant sign much further away. I see better at around 11 o'clock, I'm kind of a morning person, than I would at four o'clock. And so I see things that are moving differently from things that are stationary, things in color, and all day long, this is changing. But I had this experience where I I had, for quite some time, I was wearing a contact lens in one eye for reading. And I remember I came back from the office one day, and this is in the evening now, and I'm trying to take the contact lens out, and I'm killing myself, (laughs) poking, and I can't get it out. And that was because when I finally realized I never put it in. And then I reflect and I realized, you know, I saw fine all day, and I've never worn them again. You know, so I think that what happens is that when something goes wrong, people reach right away for some way to fix it and fix it in a stationary way. And I think that causes trouble. You know, if you had trouble and you needed to take x lax or some whatever else uh, to help you in the bathroom, that's fine. But if you take it every day, you're sort of teaching your body not to work on its own. And so, you know, you can't see you wear glasses but glasses, I think, were originally designed you know, for temporary, not for permanent use. So what people should do, unless you're almost blind, is take the glasses off and you know, put them on when you really need them and to pay attention to when you need them and when you don't. And if you find, for instance, like me, that your vision is not as good late in the day, then maybe you should take a nap or an energy bar. These energy bars I find so funny. You know, when I was younger, we used to call them candy bars. <laughs> well, you were saying. Really what stands out in much of your work and the message in the book is that often what happens, we have a limit imposed on ourselves, either by some diagnosis someone else makes, some you know number, me back then, um, not having 20-20 vision. And, you know, we kind of then live our lives from that box. Right. No, I think it's it's almost sinful, you know, that we took too seriously this normal distribution, which essentially, in whatever dimension we're being measured, we could be all the way over on the left. Well, we really can't do whatever it is, don't have the talent, most of us in the middle. And then you have the people on the, the other end that are extraordinary. And you know, people keep themselves in those positions unnecessarily right? without even asking who decided the criteria. One of my new pet peeves is we have people called super tasters, people who are super learners, super memories. And as soon as you give it a label, it almost necessarily tells everybody else that they can't do it. And there's no way that they could know that. In fact, The biggest problem, I think one of the biggest problems we have is that we're oblivious to the fact that science only gives us probabilities. And everything we learn in school, when we're younger especially, um, and from our parents, are absolute facts. So you might enjoy this. If I asked you how much is one plus one, what would you say? Two. But I read the book, so I know what the the actual answer is going to be. (laughs) Let me tell you, I had, it was so much fun. The other day I asked chat, GPT-5, how much is one plus one? And chat says two. I said, come on, it can be other things as well. Said, no, no, it's two. So, but as you've just revealed, it's not at least two. If you add one pile of sand plus one pile of sand, one plus one is one. You add one cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. You add one watt of chewing gum plus one watt of chewing, and so on. In the real world, it probably doesn't equal two as or more often as it does. Now, the advantage of knowing this is that if, let's say, right after we finish, somebody comes over to you and says, Gregory, how much is one plus one? 
you're not going to mindlessly blurt out to. What you're going to do is recognize, you're going to look at the context, realize that sometimes it can be one, sometimes it can be two. Actually, if you're using the base two number system, it's written as 10. And so then you give your answer in a much more conditional way. You become mindful. When we're mindless, we think we know. We take these absolutes. There's no need to pay any attention because, after all, we know what it is. We know horses don't eat meat, for example. When we're mindful, we're aware that everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. And essentially, uncertainty is the rule, not the exception. So if you know you don't know, and if you add to that that no one knows, so you don't feel bad about knowing, everything becomes new and potentially exciting. If you knew what I was going to say next, why would you listen? That's correct. Yep. You know, you would know it. There's an entire chapter dedicated to variability in the book, and I'm aware of it. I've written at one point a a review article on the seasonal changes of cholesterol and all the different sources of variability in body temperature. But I think, you know, most people just think, oh, like this is a, a lab test in this number, and this is, you know, true. But it's true within a range, right? Like, and, and it's why I really loved your borderline effect study about HbA1c and diabetes. So could you maybe just share a little bit of that with the listeners? Sure. So the borderline effect. So imagine that you have a donut and the donut is going to expire. You know, they can't sell it in 10 minutes. Do you know anybody who wouldn't eat the donut? You know, so we have to recognize that there's something silly, but to make it clearer, the difference at the borderline is negligible, if anything. So let's say we give an IQ test, and one person gets a 69, which means they're cognitively deficient, what we used to call retarded, but I'm not sure what we call it now, and the other person gets a 70. There, nobody would think there's a meaningful difference between 69 and 70, right? You could have sneezed, misread the question, and so on. Nevertheless, now that you're put into different categories where the 69 has problems, 70 is normal, over time, the two people that are the same to start are going to diverge dramatically. It's the same thing when you're speaking about disease. For any disease, any diagnosis, there are going to be people who just miss the cutoff, thank goodness I don't have it, are not different from the people who are told they do have it. So the people are the same. It's a diagnosis that creates the difference, which is more evidence for mind-body unity. And so we did this with uh, diabetes. It's very difficult to do because many of the diagnoses, as you know, are made up from some algorithm using many different measures at once. But the point, again, is that the people at this borderline are no different but come to see themselves as different, and our perceptions of ourselves as having whatever the disorder or disease is it takes an enormous toll on us. And I think that's really important because, you know, sometimes algorithms, complicated algorithms, will give a diagnosis and treatment plan, but it's not unusual, especially for certain conditions in the, the medical system, that they treat numbers, right? They try to get a number yeah. in the correct range, and, you know, if like with cholesterol, as an example for listeners, it's probably not as robust now. But there's been dozens and dozens of studies, when I looked at it back to as early as 1960, that looked at seasonal effects of cholesterol. And the, the big picture would be that cholesterol tends to be 5 to 8% higher in the winter than in the summer. So depending on yeah. when we get our cholesterol measured, we may or may not be on one side of the borderline, so to speak. Right, exactly. But also, um, if you imagine... In the people who suffer from what is the seasonal affective disorder, so their cholesterol level is going to be different from people who don't have that problem. Much of that can be brought about by our minds. You know that there's a way of organizing yourself where we can even make it quite literal. You can have lamps, you know, to help you. It doesn't have to vary with the season. But you keep going back to the variability, and I think that that's probably the most important part of of so much of this, that everything is changing. All variability means is things are not staying still. And we tend to hold them still in our minds when, in fact, they're actually moving around. And it's interesting because I think people hold things still in order to get control over them. You know, I want to see what kind of person you are, so I call you by some, yeah, you're 
you're that kind of person. And now I feel I can control myself, know what to expect. But in doing that, what I'm missing is all the times you're not that kind of person. At any rate, the, the variability is a key, I think, to actually controlling our own chronic illnesses. So let me, let me explain this to people. Most people, when you're given a diagnosis from some chronic disorder, hear that as it's uncontrollable. Now, and people, I think, need to understand that uncontrollable in that context only means that the medical world hasn't given you a solution. I personally think there's almost always something we can do, even before I talk, talk to you about our attention to symptom variability. I've spent a lot of time, as I know you know, talking about trying to get evidence for mind-body unity. The other day, I realized people don't even have a notion of body unity. What do I mean by that? You know, that everything that happens to any part of your body is simultaneously happening to every part of your body. We might not have the technology to measure the change, but surely there's change. You know, so we're doing a study now that's kind of fun where we have people lifting weights for their biceps, where they're taught about body unity, you know, that anything you do for any part of your body, just as any thought is going to affect all of your body, they're made aware of that or not. And then we're going to assess the strength of their stomach muscles and so on. So you believe that there's nothing you can do. I'm saying that, yes, that uh, make the rest of yourself strong. You know, you're something wrong with your stomach, make your chest stronger, exercise your legs. But beyond that, what people seem to think is that their symptoms with these chronic illnesses are going to stay the same or get worse. Nothing moves in only one direction. Sort of like the stock market. You know, when the stock market is going up or down, it doesn't go up in a straight line. It goes up a little, then it comes down a tiny bit, up more, and so on. And so it is with whatever changes we're experiencing. So we develop this treatment, we'll call it, where we have people attend to when they're feeling better, even if most of the time you think you're going to feel worse. And then you ask the question, why? So let me put this in a different order. What people need to understand is that mindfulness, as I study it, is simply noticing. All right. When you think things are still, you don't notice all the ways that they're changing. So now we're making people more mindful with respect to their symptoms. We begin this by just calling. And how are you feeling now? And is it better, whatever the symptom is that we're going to focus on, is it better or worse than the last time we spoke? And why? Now, what happens is four things, actually. The first thing is that in doing this, you're exercising some control. And you perceive yourself as having some control over the chronic illness, and that feels good. The second thing is that you're going to notice, gee, sometimes I am a little better. Because, you know, with stress, chronic pain, people think they have the symptom all the time. Third, by asking why now, is it better or worse than the last time? You engage in a mindful search. You're looking for differences. You're looking for ways that things this time were different from the last time. 45 years of research that we've done has shown that this simple process of actively noticing means that neurons are firing and it's literally and figuratively enlivening. I think it's it's so brilliant a concept. I love it, and I know it's it matches or overlaps somewhat with what I tend to do. So when I experience something in my body that's you know gets my attention, so to speak, right? So maybe some like pressure in my head, what maybe someone else would call a headache. I I would say, well, I'm not the kind of person that gets headaches, but if I get yeah. a sensation there, I just assume, oh, this would be like if an infant was in the room crying. My job would yeah. be to pay attention to it, like, you know, and comfort it, right? So if I have a sensation in my, say that, like a, a headache sensation, it's, oh, well, let me just pay attention to that for a little bit. And typically, very quickly, it just moves and dissipates. It's the idea that perhaps we should just call some of these aches and pains sensations. And if we do what you've done and what I've studied is recognize that it's going to change, and then you just ask the question, why? We found changes across a host of big things, MS, uh, strokes, Parkinson's, 
chronic pain, arthritis, all by this very simple say, psychological treatment. And the, the last one of those explanations of why this is good, I said there were four, I had the fourth one, which is you're more likely, I believe, to find a solution if you're looking for one than if you're not. And, and that's really important because once we're given information, we take information from the, the well-meaning but sometimes wrong medical world, we're not looking for this variability. We take the facts as more true than we should. People don't realize that medical research, like all research, only gives us probabilities. It does not give us absolute facts. It says that if you get a result doing the study, if you were to do the exact same study again, and you can never do exactly the same thing, but if you were to, you're likely to get the same finding. Those probabilities are then reported and people then study them as absolute. Most horses under certain circumstances don't eat meat. It's reported as horses don't eat meat, just as one in one is two. Well, one in one is two, but one in one can also, as we said, be written as 10 or be one. So there. Well, thank you. So you mentioned your idea of mindfulness, right? That's a core part of yes. going back even to your, I think your first book. And, you know, that's fundamentally noticing things. And one of the things I loved in this book, the new book, was chapter nine on mindful contagion. And the idea that our mindfulness or lack thereof may both notice and impact others. And I especially love the something in the air study. It's, it's so funny because I, I had a chapter uh, when I first sent the book to the publishers and I called it the woo-woo chapter. And there were a number of things there. They pleaded with me to take out and they took them out. There's so much in the book that I feel very confident in that I didn't want, and I had some of these strange ideas for that to deflect from the importance and potential utility of the other work. But the woo-woo study, this woo-woo study, what we did was we had meditators in a room meditating. Then they left. Then participants who didn't know that the room had just been occupied by meditators enter the room, and we give them tests. Versus we have an empty room and participants then enter the empty room, and we give them tests. And what happens is the people who are in the room that had just been occupied by people who are meditating outperform the other group, hence the name, you know, something in the air. If I had the funds and the time, I might replicate the study where I have a fan in the room you know, <laughs> after they leave to see how <laughs> durable the effect is. But yeah, there are, we have a number of studies where we can show that mindfulness is contagious and some that are, you know, are not particularly woo-woo, you know, that if it's the case, if, when you're mindful, you're there and people know that you're there. In the culture, we have expressions like the lights on, but nobody's home. You know, people know that there is some, what is another one, only one oar in the water and we're drawn to people who are present. And so, and, and why might that be? Because when you're mindful, you're not being evaluative because evaluation makes no sense in that there are always multiple explanations for everything we do. So now I've said three or four things that I think are important to me to people to decode, but I don't see how they can without a little more information. One is that Mindfulness, as I study it, again, has nothing to do with meditation. They're just separate. They're both fine, but they're separate. Meditation isn't mindfulness. Meditation is a practice you engage in to result in post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness, as I study it, as you said, is just a simple process of noticing. When we actively notice, we come alive we see things from multiple perspectives. You know that everything is changing. So there's a, a general uncertainty that is not present most of the time for most people, sadly. People think they know, while all the while things are changing and look different from different perspectives. And uncertainty is the rule rather than the exception. And people need to learn how to exploit the power in uncertainty rather than, than hold things still. So the way to become more mindful is just to recognize this uncertainty 
which came to me in one single blow when seeing that horse eat the meat. Or you can become more mindful by taking the things you know and just noticing new things about it. You know, if you're married, notice three new things about your spouse, which will be very good for the relationship, by the way, you know, self feel seen. Before I started to paint, I used to think that, except in the fall, trees were green. And then I started to paint, so I started looking at trees, and I see, wow, I mean, hundreds of different shades of green that all change depending on where the sun is in the sky. You know, so this one thing became so many things, it became much more exciting. Well, I think that's the way of anything. I take multiple walks just around my block each day to take a break from work. And it's not long. It's, say, 600 steps once around. But there's probably, in a given week, a few of those I do fairly mindlessly. And then the much more enjoyable ones when I'm noticing the birds chirping and the ocean waves in the background and seeing the flowers, right? The much more restorative one. And so even I can get way better at being mindful more and more of my time. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think that that's the way I tell people to start right in the beginning, just walk outside and notice things you don't typically notice. You probably know the gorilla study. Yeah. I remember that was a YouTube phenomenon at one point. I I, I didn't see the gorilla. (laughs) Okay. Not most people don't. So uh, people are watching a basketball game and in the middle of the game, somebody dressed in a gorilla suit comes on the court. You don't notice it. We did an experiment where we told people, you know, all basketball games are like all other basketball games, which is why we call them basketball games. But just as certainly, each basketball game is different from each other. We want you to watch this video and notice the ways it's the same and the ways it's different, which means being mindful, right? And when that is the instruction, people do notice. So the problem is that when you don't notice, you don't know that you're missing anything. So we're not hearing what's being, you know, what's out to be heard. We're not tasting. We're, we're not using our senses and we're missing so much of the world, oblivious to it. A way of understanding that is that when you're not there, when you're mindless, you're not there to know you're not there. And our research suggests that over 45 years, sadly, most of us are not there most of the time. Yeah, that is sad. But being there is good. Yeah. Well, and the last thing I wanted to get to, and it's because you've done so much work on decision making, a thought I loved from the book and you know want to make sure that I act on is I'll just read it. Rather than worry about whether the decision was right, we should try to make it work. Sure. I'll tell you about that in the way if you're going to put it on your refrigerator is don't worry about making the right decision, make the decision right. And this is one where I disagree with Probably, I guess I've read at least the decision theorists out there who seem to suggest that there's some cost-benefit analysis that we should do when we're making decisions. And nobody does that. And I'm here to say that nobody should be doing that. Because when you recognize that costs and benefits are in our heads, they're not in events. Events aren't good or bad. That every cost is also a benefit. Every benefit is also a cost if you choose to notice it. And if that's the case, if something is simultaneously a cost and a benefit, you can't add it up to know what to do. It's going to be zero. And in addition to that, people think they should gather information. It's nice to have information, but you can't gather information to make the, quote, right decision because there's no natural endpoint to how much information to take in. And each new piece could completely change the decision you're making. Probably easier for people to understand without reading it and thinking about it is that we make a decision to take an action. As soon as you take the action, you can no longer evaluate the sense of the decision. Should I go to Harvard or Yale? Okay, so I decide to go to Harvard, and I hate it. So now I'm going to leave and I'm going to Yale. I'm no longer the same person, right? I've got at least a semester on my belt, all right? So we can't evaluate the quality of the decision. And I think that people who experience regret mindlessly are saying to themselves when they're not happy with something, oh, the other choice would have been better. It could have been better. It could have been worse. It could have been the same. But even more important, it could be whatever you want it to be. That, again, no matter what happens, there are ways of understanding it so that it's positive. Now, people are going to say, 
from my ivory tower. It's easy for me to speak. And I had this major fire that destroyed 80% of what I owned. And I'll tell you that I lived in the Charles Hotel for a while. This was around Christmas. And the most wonderful thing happened that I went out to be with friends on Christmas Eve. I came back to the hotel and my room was full of gifts, not from the management, but from the so-called little people, the chambermaids, the waitresses, the people who parked my car. It was beautiful. And, you know, it took me years, Greg, to be able to tell the story without it bringing tears to my eyes. And every Christmas, when I start and I reflect on how people really prefer to be, can be, many are basically good. It's a very nice thought. And I don't remember anything that I lost in that fire. Well, I'm so, choking out uh, just hearing the story. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, you know, you add it all together, even that. But I think that we most people are stressed most of the time for very little good reason. And another one of my one-liners is that they should ask themselves, is it a tragedy or an inconvenience? Because rarely is it a tragedy. And, you know, as soon as you call it an inconvenience, then you readjust and don't take it so seriously. So the relationship between stress and what we're talking about is I think that one of the biggest stressors for people are making these decisions and looking for the right answer. Should I take this job? Should I get divorced? Should I have the surgery? And there's no way of knowing. See, I know for me, until a decision is made, whatever that thing is will be consuming what I would refer to as some of my mental bandwidth. And you know, if it's a big thing, consuming a lot, I just have realized, it's going way back, that I need to make some decision quickly to free that bandwidth up because once the bandwidth is free, one, it makes all everything else easier. I know my health just isn't going to be as robust yeah. if my brain is having something ruminate over and over. So I tend to make decisions, you know, on the, the quick side. And well, that's you know, what all of my research and thinking says. That's exactly that's exactly what we should all be doing. And you think about emergency medicine. You know, they don't have time to do cost benefit analyses. I think that the idea of just randomly making the decision. And then making it work for you is actually a strategy that is uh, very effective. And I have something in the book about some CEOs of major corporations, but that's the way they make them, just the way you said. I asked my students, I said, spend the week without making any decisions. Use some rule, you know, maybe the first thing that comes to mind, uh, the quickest, whatever rule you're going to use, but you're not going to think about the decision. You're just going to use this rule to make your choice. And then they come back the next week and report that it was a stress-free week. You know, we're stressed because we think we should know how to make the right decision and we can't know the right decision. We don't appreciate that predictability is an illusion. You can't predict the individual case, even if you can predict what the group is going to do. And for all of us who are making the decisions, it's the individual case. I, I don't know if people understand if that's clear to anybody other than me. But let's say, oh, I don't know, Larry Bird and I, I'll make a Michael Jordan, not that it makes a difference, are going to each shoot one basket. You would be foolish to bet your life savings that he's going to beat me. One basket. He sometimes misses. I sometimes get it in. Now, if we were given 20 baskets to shoot, surely he'd beat me. We just never know for the individual case, strange things happen, so that when you accept that you don't know, then you need a different way of organizing your life. It can't be by trying to find the best way to do whatever it is, because things change, and there's no way of knowing what's best. And once you accept that we are in charge of our experience of whatever happens, and the more mindful we are the more options we have for how to understand whatever happens, the easier life becomes. I agree. I guess like one of my beliefs is, at least for me personally, argue for possibility. So, you know, I'm assuming I don't know what's possible. So let me argue for the best story that, you know, yeah. is reasonably possible. So, and on that note, I want to just, you know, give you a chance to let our listeners know where to find out more information from you, follow your work. Again, I highly recommend everyone listening to read the book, The Mindful Body, that we've been talking about. And if you just Google me, whatever I'm doing lately will probably pop up. 
And my website is ellenlanger.me, I think. But if you do .com, it'll take you to whatever it is. You could also find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us today, Ellen. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. This podcast is for informational purposes only. The podcast is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You should not use the information on the podcast for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease or prescribing any medication or other treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider before taking any medication or nutritional, herbal, or homeopathic supplement, and with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this or any other podcast. Reliance on the podcast is solely at your own risk. Information provided on the podcast does not create a doctor-patient relationship between you and any of the health professionals affiliated with our podcast. Information and statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to therein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician. 